In the early 1970s, an immense tragedy befell a small, middle-income community just northwest of Houston's downtown Texas. As teenage boys ranging in age from 13 to 18 began disappearing mysteriously without a trace. After a three-year period, 28 young men would be found dead, wrapped in plastic film. The police, dumbfounded, were quick to declare the missing victims as runaways from a rundown neighborhood. Little did anyone realize that lurking in the shadows, under the guise of a friendly neighborhood electrician, was none other than a sinister murderer. The man responsible, Dean Coral, also known as the Candyman, undertook one of the worst massacres in American history. As his name, Candyman, suggests, Dean was a candy giver, but all this enticed his victims as he carried out his master plan. The Candyman was born on Christmas Eve 1939 in Fort Wayne, a quaint town in the northeastern part of Indiana. The eldest of two boys, Coral and his younger brother Stanley, grew up in a combative and lonely household and were often left alone with sitters. His parents, Arnold Coral and Mary Robinson, experienced a turbulent relationship with constant bickering and fighting, which later led to their first divorce in 1946. The couple remarried in 1950 and moved to Pasadena, Texas, but marital bliss was short-lived and both divorced three years later. Robinson married Jake West, a traveling salesman, and started a small candy factory called Pecan Prince, where Coral worked day and night. Meanwhile, Mary started her own business, the Coral Candy Factory, after divorcing a third time in 1963. The next phase of Coral's life involved a 10-month stint serving in the U.S. Army at Fort Polk, Louisiana in 1964. There, he received basic training and was permanently assigned to Fort Hood, Texas, a few hours drive from Houston, as a radio repair person. During his stay in the military, Coral experimented with his sexuality, experiencing his first same-sex encounter. However, his time in the service didn't last long, as he hated it and quickly left. Following his discharge in the Army, Coral worked full-time at his mother's candy store. Located in the Heights, just across from an elementary school, Coral often gives passing children free candy, earning him his famed name, Candyman. Coral spent most of his time entertaining and flirting with the shop's younger employees, his influence growing on them like the Pied Piper. Coral even installed a pool table that would further attract the young boys. The hangout spot helped Dean create a great rapport with them, making it easier for them to trust him. However, it wouldn't be long before the family business would experience serious financial blows and soon shut down, leaving Coral to work as an electrician at the Houston Lighting Company. In 1970, Coral befriended David Brooks, a troubled 12-year-old boy who came from a broken home. Their friendship developed relatively fast, and from sexual favors, Brooks became an accomplice receiving $200 as an incentive to bring in any local boy. A dry town, the Heights forbid the sale of alcohol. Coral used this band to his advantage, luring would-be victims into his home with promises of beer and liquor. While inside, Coral plied the teens with drugs and alcohol before handcuffing them to a plywood torture board, stripping them naked and molesting them. Coral would keep these boys for days at a time before shooting or strangling them to death. Afterwards, Coral would carry the lifeless bodies to one of four hideouts, each an hour or two's drive outside away. A woodland area at Lake Sam Rayburn, where his family had a cabin, a rented boat shed, the Jefferson County Beach, and the High Island Beach. But who were the young victims who didn't get to live up through the best years of their youth? His first victim was Jeffrey Conan, an 18-year-old college freshman. The year was 1970 and Conan was just returning from a hitchhiking expedition when Coral offered him a ride home. But Conan never made it back. The police found his body in 1973 with the help of Brooks. Forensics declared that Coral had violated and strangled Conan with a cloth covering his mouth before burying him at High Island Beach. Soon after this incident, Brooks happened to walk in on Coral raping two other boys in Coral's apartment. When confronted by Brooks, Coral claimed that it was just for fun. But he killed the young teens afterwards and bribed Brooks with a car, a Corvette, in exchange for his silence. In December 1970, Coral made his next move against 14-year-olds James Glass and Danny Yates. The boys were walking home from a religious rally and were invited to Coral's apartment since they were friends. Coral then sexually assaulted and strangled the boys to death, dumping their remains in his rented boat shed. Two months later, Brooks and Coral then kidnapped two brothers, Donald Waldrop, 15, and Jerry, 13. Both boys were walking to a bowling alley when Coral attacked them, abusing and then killing them before dumping their remains, once again in his rented boat shed. By May of 1971, Randall Harvey, 15, David Hilgiest, 13, and Gregory Winkle, 16, all suffered the same fate and added to the list of casualties. Around this time, Brooks introduced Elmer Henley to Coral. Brooks suspected Henley would become their next victim, but later, Coral took a liking to Henley, making him a second accomplice. 
The parents of the young victims, all in the Heights, frantically started searching for their missing sons. They often held search parties and put up posters, offering rewards to anyone who would have information. Henley even participated in one of the searches for David Hilgiest, yet he kept numb, knowing full well who the culprit was. The Candyman sure had a few tricks up his sleeves, and one of his favorites was holding beguiling parties at his home. And on one fateful party day, he had Brooks invite a 17-year-old Reuben Watson Haney over for some drinks. Coral ended up strangling the teen, burying him in his boat shed. Henley told authorities that Coral abducted and killed two more men that year. Their identities so far remain unknown. By February 1972, Henley actively began taking part in the killings, luring his first victim, 17-year-old Willard Branch Jr., who reportedly disappeared in the hands of the Candyman. Coral picked up the teenager off 11th Street in Studwood, in the Heights, and then took him home where they ended up smoking marijuana when Henley tricked Branch into wearing some handcuffs before leaving him in the Candyman's hands. A month later, 18-year-old Frank Aguirre, a close friend to Henley, fell victim to the inhumanity, meeting his doom as he enjoyed his drink when Coral pounced on him and strangled him to death. Coral's desire to abuse and torture his victims only grew stronger as he targeted six more teenage boys between May and November of 1972. The Candyman shot and killed 16-year-old Johnny DeLome in the head. He then strangled to death 17-year-old Billy Balk, a former employee at Coral Candy. Coral's other victims were 14-year-old Wally J. Simono, who vanished while on his way to his friend's place, followed by 13-year-old Richard Hembry, who Coral shot in the mouth. The Candyman had no pity and even strangled 17-year-old Stephen Sickman with a nylon cord. In December of 1972, one brave victim, Mark Scott, refused to go down without a vicious fight. Scott stabbed Coral when he grabbed him, but gave up when Henley held him at gunpoint. Coral then tortured Scott and left him dead, but his remains are yet to surface. Richard Kepner was Coral's last victim that year. Coral choked him to death just after having a phone call with his fiancé from a payphone. After taking a three-month break due to developing hydrocele, swelling of the scrotum, the Candyman resumed his operations in February of 1973. Candyman's next casualty was Joseph Lyles, an acquaintance of Brooks. Coral got a hold of him at Wirt Road and Houston Spring Branch Road, and buried him at Jefferson County Beach. The unfortunate turn of events for the young men in Houston didn't stop there. Coral was still acting on his evil desires, and in June of the same year, Coral abducted two hitchhikers, Billy Ray Lawrence, 15, and Ray Blackburn, 20. After leaving the boys alive for four days, Coral murdered the two, disposing of their bodies at Lake Sam Raper. The next month in July, Henley met and befriended Homer Garcia at a class for driver's education, and invited him over to his apartment to hang out. Coral shot Garcia twice in the head and chest, leaving him to bleed in the bathtub before burying him at Lake Sam Rayburn. The Candyman's last five victims all fell within three weeks, accelerated by his craving for new sexual experiences. Coral shot 17-year-old John Sellers in the chest. The Candyman then choked 15-year-old Michael Balk to death and strangled 18-year-old Marty Jones. Shortly afterward, Coral shot 17-year-old Charles Cobbs twice in the head. His last victim was 13-year-old James Draymala. Coral and Henley pulled up on Draymala as he was riding his bike in South Houston and choked the boy to death. Dre Mala last called his parents and told him he was at a party in town. The man behind the famous Houston mass murders met his doomsday on August 8, 1973, when Henley shot him. Henley had invited his friends Tim Curley and a young lady Rhonda Williams for a few drinks at Coral's place. But Coral didn't like the idea of Henley bringing others to the house and became visibly agitated. Coral grabbed a gun and pointed it at the three. Henley managed to convince Coral to relax, and while he was unaware, Henley put six bullets right through his chest with a 22 caliber pistol. Henley later told the authorities that he was only defending himself, since Coral was intent on harming him and his friends. The Candyman, one of America's most prolific killers and pedophiles, killed more than 28 young men in a three-year span, leaving nearly no traces behind. He could abduct all his victims so swiftly that all of them could disappear unawares, and their bodies only found after his own demise. The pedophile lured his victims with kind gestures, drinks, and drugs only to pounce on them with shackles and handcuffs, defiling them on a plywood torture board. Yet being a secret maniac was not enough. Even after his death, many still remember him for his generosity. 